Hi, my name's Laura Richards and I am from the University of Leeds. I'm a lecturer in EAP. I'm really uh, excited to talk to you today about something that has become part of my practice and has been part of my teaching practice for quite some time now, and that is in fact exploratory practice. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about what exploratory practice is and the multimodal dimensions and affordances of it. So the aims of this presentation are to introduce the concept of exploratory practice or EP as a pedagogic approach and then uh, discuss why it works in our context at Leeds and why we, we decided to use it. Uh, also to uh, try to evidence the multimodality uh, that EP, EP has. Now it's very difficult to do in such a short session, but hopefully by um, hearing me describe the process and uh, looking at the posters that the students produce at the end of their project, you'll get a better sense of um, how it really is a multimodal endeavour. And also to invite you to consider EP as a framework for inclusive mod multimodal teaching and learning that might apply to your context, something that you might consider in the future. So here's a brief overview of what I plan to cover in the presentation. So the multimodality in uh, UK higher education, the challenges of intermediate multidisciplinary EAP, the multimodality of EP, EP in practice with some example posters which you can spend some time looking at, and the implications and application of EP perhaps to your own practice. Before I go on to talk about exploratory practice, I'd like to first give my um, preferred definitions of multimodality. So Crawford uh, Camichicholi and uh, Campoy Cubillo, please excuse my, <laughs> my pronunciation, um, use this lovely definition here. So the ability to successfully engage with texts that integrate different semiotic resources. And I think when you take this together with Archer's definition here, so multimodal pedagogies encourage the use of a range of modes and a range of resources. Um, I, I think this really encapsulates what multimodality is to me. Um, and obviously, in this definition, it's, it's important to understand that there are so many different modes that can be employed. It's not about um, using them all or using as many as possible, but understanding that they are used in different ways and finding ways of helping the students to understand that too. Next, I want to consider multimodality in UK higher education. And the UK here is in brackets is because this obviously doesn't just apply to the UK, it applies pretty much everywhere. And multimodality has become ubiquitous. It's everywhere in the students' lives. It's um, in the communications they receive, it's in their classes, in lectures, um, it's across all forms of communications and texts that they deal with. Um, and this obviously extends beyond their time at university as well. This is a result, as Trimber and Press suggest, of the digital revolution, which took place 25 to 30 years ago, and the introduction of the internet, um, different forms of digital text. But importantly as well, it's cross and interdisciplinary. And this becomes important uh, on my programme because it's a, a, a multidisciplinary programme. But every discipline that the students could possibly study will have some form of multimodality in some different way. So I'd like to give a little bit of context about the programme that I run at the University of Leeds. It is um, a semester one only programme for postgraduate students and is part of a year round programme for students going on to master's degrees. The students on this programme uh, come for a whole year before they start their postgraduate degrees and they enter with um, usually a five in IELTS, no less than an overall five in IELTS. Um, some have a little bit more, but the one thing that they all have in common is that their profiles are often very spiky, meaning that some of them are much stronger in uh, reading and writing and some are stronger in speaking and listening. And this can uh, cause some issues, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, it's also a multidisciplinary course or EGAP as some people would view it. I tend to think of it more as multidisciplinary because we uh, try to um, move away from teaching generic um, general skills um, and instead make as much space as possible for the students to focus on their own disciplines. 
As I mentioned, there are some challenges for the students on the Academic English for Postgraduate Studies Level 1 programme, or the APES programme as we call it. So there's a tension between their disciplinary expertise, as they are often um, teaching assistants in their home countries or already have postgraduate degrees, and their listening linguistic competence and their contextual familiarity. They can find it quite frustrating um, that they don't understand the way that everything functions in UK higher education. There's also the issue of disciplinary representation that Swales mentions, where um, we find we have quite a lot of social science students and far fewer hard science students, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't endeavour to um, account for, for these disciplinary differences and ensure that all disciplines are um, equally represented. Um, but it can be a challenge at times, particularly coming from a social science discipline myself. Uh, there are time constraints, as I think most people are aware, on pre-sessional courses, and sometimes it can feel like a struggle to um, get everything into the classes that you want to. Um, there are some issues with the uptake of extracurricular opportunities, and perhaps because of linguistic competence or contextual familiarity. Um, and another issue that we find on this particular programme is that the students have uh, often competing external demands from family or from employment. Now this may no longer be as much of an issue, particularly with um, uh, the changes to the visa regulations, which I'm not going to go into here, um, but it has been a particular issue in the past. Lots of students coming with children, um, some students coming who are pregnant, and it can have a, um, a significant impact on their progress and their studies. But one of the reasons we chose to um, adopt EP as a pedagogic approach for this particular module is because we felt it really um, helped us to overcome a lot of those challenges. So in, uh, EP has seven principles, uh, which very briefly are to put quality of life first, to work primarily to understand language classroom life, uh, to involve everybody in the classroom, to work to bring people together, to work also for mutual development of both students and teachers, to integrate the work for understanding into classroom practice, and to make the work a continuous enterprise. So it's not something that happens in a couple of finite lessons, but it continues throughout the programme. And we do this through potentially exploitable pedagogic activities, which really means identifying any um, normal classroom activities, for example, writing and conducting a survey, but using it for the purposes of exploring a puzzle. And this puzzle will be something that the students are interested in, uh, related to their own language learning and their own uh, experience in the language classroom. It's also a socio-material endeavour. Um, so there's consideration of more than language and text, it's matter things and material performance. So it goes beyond just the materials that the students are given or that we ask them to look at or to work with, but they're considering uh, lots of experiential um, parts of their classroom life. It's consensus and cooperation building, which is a really great way for the students to feel more comfortable taking risks with language as well, um, but it prepares them for the following modules, but most importantly, it prepares them for their postgraduate studies and for any group work that they may need to conduct there. Lastly, it's practitioner motivated. The students choose their own puzzles um, with some uh, input from the uh, tutor, but um, ultimately it's up to the students to uh, investigate these puzzles themselves and to engage with the exploratory practice process. If you'd like to know more about this, um, please um, have a quick look at my reference list. Uh, uh, All Right and Hanks are, are two of um, the uh, big proponents of this approach in the EAP classroom. With all of this in mind, we need to consider why and how EP is actually multimodal. Um, and Hanks wrote about this in 2021 and said, using multimodal methods to explore their puzzles, uh, which I'll show you in a second, and posters or uh, sticky objects to disseminate their work, learners are potent agenda setters, investigators, and theorizers. And I think this is a really um, interesting way of, um, it, of understanding um, the inherent multimodality that is in exploratory practice. 
Um, because it means that the learners, as, as I said, uh, kind of discussing the principles of EP, really have agency and they make these choices themselves about what to investigate, how to investigate it and how to navigate all the different modes of communication and um, modes of text production uh, that they might encounter. So in order to understand this uh, a bit better, let's look at EP in practice. So we have various stages of the EP process or the framework, and here are some examples of what they look like. So collaborating really means navigating and selecting appropriate communicative modes um, and social settings, which can be tricky for the students, making decisions about how to communicate with their groups um, and how to plan and conduct the work. The puzzling process, so actually, deciding what they want to investigate, so considering experiences of language learning, including interaction with texts. Then the planning, so using graphic tools, um, making choices about how to plan their work um, and how to share that planning process with their group mates and to visualise and plan the actual project. So this is often working with timelines and dates, some graphic representation as well. Then the actual investigating where they're collecting primary and secondary data and exploring uh, their puzzles and their findings through various textual methods. Some textual analysis, um, occasionally we get some kind of statistical analysis, um, but often it's looking at interviews and comments on surveys to try and understand their puzzles better, although there is some desk-based research involved as well. And then deciding how to present their results. And I'll show you um, how students have done this in a second. But they make choices about what information, what graphics um, to include on these posters that they produce. Um, and it really gives them the opportunity to explore their creativity as well. And lastly, we give them an opportunity to reflect on the EP process. Um, and something that we've introduced for this year is that the students will create a screencast and they, this can be anything that they want. It can be um, in any way representative of their experience. And this is actually carried over from another module that I run where we had great success with it. And um, so this is another really multimodal digital artifact that the students are producing to show, share their experience. So I'm going to quickly uh, flick through these posters and let you have a look at them. The puzzles that the students have chosen are at the top here. You can see how can uh, listening boost your language learning process. Um, so feel free to pause, um, have a look. If you've got the slide, zoom in um, and have a look at what the students have produced. And this is the culmination of all of their puzzling and uh, investigation for their exploratory practice project. So lastly, I want to talk about the implications and application of EP. So for me, it's about the journey rather than the destination. The students don't need to uh, really solve a puzzle or find any recommendations, but what they learn through the process of exploring their puzzles is the most important thing in this process. Um, and as Hanks and Allwright mention frequently in their writing on EP, it's about agency and autonomy. So giving the students the opportunity to take control of something and create something meaningful. It's relevant to the learners, therefore, and they really understand that this is not just about them finding answers, but it's about them engaging with the process. Um, it has a digital dimension. The students need to navigate a lot of different digital texts, um, which means that they become much more proficient. But also because they're using different types of media to communicate their findings and to reflect, it gives them more options, particularly when we uh, consider some of the linguistic barriers that some of the students at this level face. And lastly, it's flexible and adaptable, meaning that you can apply it in lots of different contexts and you can ask the students to go as deep into this as you really want them to. Um, you can do it as a short two lesson project or as I do, you can spread it out over, um, I think it's six weeks that we now do it over, um, really giving the students the opportunity to dig into their language learning puzzle. So lastly, I'd just like to say thank you for listening. There will be an opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A at the end. Um, alternatively, you can email me if you have any more questions. Um, I hope this has inspired you to go out and uh, consider whether or not EP might be right for you and your classes. Here are my references. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much, everybody.